Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jody Hoynoski. I am Executive Director of Holstein Ident and Identification Services at Holstein USA. I've been with the company for uh, about 17 years now. I grew up on my family farm in Wisconsin uh, with registered cattle all my life and uh, really appreciate all of you folks being here today and tuning in online, uh, and especially our, our first panel of uh, producers using robotics firsthand. Uh, I'm delighted to be moderating our, our second shift panel with industry experts. The decision factors for, for automated, automated uh, milking systems and to help maybe uh, some of the audience here answer the question, are milking robots right for my farm? So for just 15 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about some of these ideas. Um, I'm not going to get down into the, into the finer details because of the time, but I'm going to stay here at a high level. Uh, but I hope that some of these um, items will uh, stimulate some discussion during the panel um, time. So uh, what I'm going to quickly cover here in the 15 minutes or so is um, kind of a snapshot of where we are today with AMS in the U.S. Um, external factors um, that can certainly play a role in the decision making that goes on with, uh, with robots. Internal factors, so um, considerations down on the farm level. And then wrap up with a few comments um, with uh, the voice of AMS farmers. So where are we today in the U.S.? So um, AMS started uh, here in North America in the early 2000s, so we're really quickly approaching 20 years of, uh, of milking robots. Um, and specifically here in the U.S. today, we're sitting around 3,500 uh, milking robots, um, and that would be uh, representative of all brands. And before you ask, because we always get asked that question almost right after, is how many cows is that? What percent of the U.S dairy population is that representing? That's about 2.5% right now of, of, milk, of dairy cows being milked robotically. So we have a long way to go. Um, obviously, there's a lot of potential here in this market. Um, and uh, that leads off to where are these robots, right? So we've got 3,500 um, in the US. And 26 states have robots right now. Um, but the concentration, for the most part, has been you know, here in the Northeast, um, through the Mid-Atlantic regions and into the Midwest, um, Pacific Northwest has, has seen some, some good concentrations. However, over the last few years, what we started to see is integration of the technology into uh, the Western states, Idaho, California, Colorado, Texas, and even starting to see some of that penetration down into the Southeast. Um, so uh, 26 states, uh, but the technology is there. All the states are, are able to have milking robots. It's just a matter of finding those markets and the potential for um, the technology to move into those states. So why did these farms, these farms milking with 3,500 uh, milking robots in the U.S., why did they choose AMS, right? You heard from three panelists today why, what some of their reasons were. But we hear um, things around higher production. We heard that from, from a couple of the panelists today. Reduction of labor costs is a reoccurring theme. Consistency in the milking process and what that can do for utter health, right, and cow health. Um, more, frequent, more frequent milking for fresh and high producing cows. Um, I think we heard from Angie that a uh, cow freshened the day after they started up, so she had a, a clean start with that, uh, with that cow in the milking robot. And she's hit 170 pounds, I think you said. Um, so uh, that frequent milking or increased number of milkings is going to help stimulate that milk production. Uh, interest in new technology. I think Brad made the comment. You know, he, he finds this, this technology really, really interesting. Um, so there's going to be producers and prospects out there that are going to really want to be ahead of the curve and get this technology on their farms. Combination of milk data with the activity system. Okay, that's a, that's a driving uh, force for some of these farms. Improved social life. Okay. Some of you may be asking, what is that? Um, we don't know what that is, so help me understand what an improved social life means. Um, more cow data to support the management decisions. Okay, So a lot of reoccurring th themes that we heard from just three panelists, so imagine what all those farms out there running um, milking robots would say. So external factors. Again, we're going to stay at a pretty high level here, but market conditions. So when's the right time to do this? A lot of farms are going to ask that question. When's the right time for me to do this? Am I going to wait for the milk price to be high? Am I going to uh, take the risk and do it when, when the market's falling? 
uh, and even down when it's in that, that, uh, in that valley? Well, um, the answer isn't that simple. Um, you know, trends in adoption um, over the last few years are showing that even with low milk prices, farms can continue to find a way to make that investment. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the creativity um, and some of the decision-making factors that, you know, folks like Brad and Angie and Mary talked about and how they have that discussion with their lender. Um, location, right? So herds don't necessarily have a lot of control over where they are. They're, they're farming where they are and, and, you know, whether there's dealers near them or not is, is not something they can control, but it's a fact of life. Um, and that could also play a major part into what decision they're going to make. Um, you want to be somewhere where there's going to be good support service uh, for the equipment. And so that's going to certainly become a brand, um, a brand factor uh, in certain states and regions. Legislation. Um, I certainly don't want to open up too many cans of worms here talking about legislation, but um, of course the number one ticket when we start thinking about how these greater things impact us on our, on our, on our daily uh, involvement in the farms, um, but immigration and access to reliable employees, it's going to be getting tougher and tougher. Right? It's an ongoing challenge. Um, I think there were some good comments from the first panelist about this, uh, about this topic, but it's not going to end. Uh, and so we've got to come up with a solution to, to getting the work done. Uh, and the minimum wage is something else that's starting to creep up, right? This is happening state by state, but as min minimum wage numbers start to increase, that's going to have an impact on what uh, the competition that farmers are going to have for their employees. On the local side, you could run into some permitting or zoning issues, um, limitations with land, and of course manure handling. So internal factors, a um, little bit more specific down to the individual farm level. Um, these three items will quickly uh, run through, but goals, um, business considerations, and then management considerations. So every farm needs to come up with a goal, right? Maybe more than one, but they have to define them. We have to understand what their goals are, and then also what are the obstacles to prevent them from reaching those goals. So what are some factors that can contribute to farm success? Well, of course, milk production, right? That's why, we, that's why we get up every day and go in the barn, right? We're in the business of making milk. Uh, feed costs have a high impact on the success of a farm. Labor costs and improved farm efficiency, cow health, reproduction, social life. Again, what is that? Some farmers have a hard time identifying what social life is, but for some, that's a goal. Farm viability is the next generation uh, interested in that family business. I think Brad touched on that a little bit, that um, it's him and his uncle, and as they start to think about how that farm progression is going to take place, um, who's going to take over the farm, and are they going to want to farm like the previous generation? Some business considerations. So, of course, the big thing that's going to come up in the, in the topic of um, milking robots is going to be money, right? Available capital. All right, and what is that going to do um, to our options? Is that going to have a, a is that going to dictate how many robots we're going to be talking about on the farm? Um, what's the future planning uh, of the of the farm? Is there expansion involved? Um, in one case, on the previous panel, there was there was a discussion of pulling the cow numbers down, but that was part of their their decision making was to actually reduce the number of cows, um, and then of course, are we going to be going new construction or renovation? And you can really see a big difference in the overall project cost between those two. So what else should we be thinking about? Well, current farm size. Um, you know, robotic milking um, that we see right now in the U.S. currently ranges anywhere from a one robot farm all the way up to 30 plus robots. Um, and it's, it's just going to keep going up from there, I suspect. Um, barn design. Um, how many robots per pen? How do we want to set that up? How do we plan to manage uh, these animals? Um, from a labor standpoint, how are we planning to handle these animals? All right, cow handling becomes a big topic in robotic uh, milking systems. All right, how much time are we going to spend in those pens? How much um, um, handling? Um, how are we going to do that? Are we going to limit the disruptions to the cows day to day? And then the final consideration for, for, for this page here 
is the age and condition of our current milk system. Right? If we just put a, a brand new milking center or milking parlor in five years ago, robots is probably not part of the discussion for a little while. Right? So that's a big, big part of the component as well. Where are we in the, in the life stage of our current milking system? Um, from there, um, are all cows going to be milked by AMS? Right? So if we've made that decision, are we going to continue to operate with two milking systems? Okay. Some management things to consider for farms uh, wondering about milking robots. The first question a lot of people ask is, will robots fit into my management practices? Right? How I do things today? Will it work? Um, I think the shift starts to, to go over to, can my management practices adapt to AMS? Right? So what am I willing to change in the way that I manage my cows to, to then to make it work with uh, robotic milking? So some other factors con considered on the management side, um, conventional versus organic. Right? There's certainly um, plenty of herds out there that are, that are um, conventional, but we do, have, uh, we do see a number of organic dairies out there successfully milking with, with robotics. Cow traffic. Um, this goes into more of the barn design, but when we start to think about how we're going to handle animals, how we're going to move them, either from pen to pen, barn to barn, um, even around the robot. Are we looking at free flow? Are we looking at guided flow? How do we plan to group the animals? How do we want to manage that? We still want to try to manage animals by high production groups, um, low production groups, um, lactation numbers. What's our goal? How, how, do, how many cows per robot are we planning to, to run our barns at? Do we want to incorporate or do we need to have cows for gra out on grazing systems? Um, comfort. Um, you heard that from some panelists as well, that cow comfort was a, was a big part of their decision making. And what goes into there, just a couple items here, cow handling location. So where are we going to touch these animals? Are we going to have them separated? Are we going to have a routing direction off of the robot that puts them into a segregated area where we can go in and handle them and not disrupt the rest of the herd? Are we going to do it in the pens, uh, in the stalls uh, like we have in the past? Um, and then stall type and bedding choice um, can be big factors uh, for herds that go uh, with robots. Manure handling, certainly la uh, last but certainly not least, uh, a big issue here. How do we get manure out of the barn? Okay, um, it all comes down to getting that out quickly and efficiently, so that we can limit the the disruption to the pens, um, move the animals as uh, uh, least during the day as, as possible. Um, but what we see out there is all the main options that you would typically see today: alley scraper, or skid steer scraper. Um, flush systems, which can be certainly dependent on location, climate, um, those kind of things. And then possibly the automated unit. And Angie mentioned that she's going to be going with a, with a collector. So um, that'll be exciting to see how that, how that works for them up there. Um, but a lot of different options when we talk about this, but it all comes down to our routines, um, cow disruption, and uh, certainly cow uh, cleanliness. So I'm going to wrap up my part of the discussion, and, and then we'll get into the, into the questions uh, later on, but um, just some voice of the AMS farmers, because I think at the end of the day, um, that holds as much value as anything when it comes to herds trying to make this decision. Um, so you already heard from Angie, uh, Mary, and Brad uh, just before our lunch here. Um, a few other comments from surveys um, that we've done uh, with some of our customers on the Laley side but I think it would hold true with any uh, robotic customer. Um, but we did a survey of some farms one year after startup, um, and when asked what they would offer as suggestions for other herds going through the decision-making process, um, you might think that I just typed this right up after um, these three folks were up here, but I didn't. Uh, visit other farms, ask questions about their management, uh, learn the pros and cons. Um, it's so important. Uh, Mary made the comment, visit a lot of farms, as many as you can, um, a lot of the manufacturers, we do it, set up um, tours, take farmers across the country or across the region, um, and visit as many farms as, as you'd like to visit. Um, visit multiple brands, right? Um, find out what's going to be right for your particular situation. 
uh, work with experienced advisors. Um, the ration is going to be key to success in a robot facility. Um, so uh, surround yourselves with advisors that are going to that are going to support your your goals. And this is one of my favorite ones because um, really at the end of the day it's 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 just as simple. You know, don't get caught up in all this technology. We're still just milking cows. All right, we're doing it differently. We're getting more data, but we still need to have good cow people. All right, we still need to do all the other things really well. We still have to harvest crops um, at the right time. We still need to focus on all the other things going on on the farm every single day. Um, so this this helps for all, helps the cows. It helps the people, uh, but really. Uh, we still have to do everything else right for, for the goals of the farm to be realized. So as uh, mentioned, I am the uh, general manager of Agritech Analytics. Uh, it's a DHIA records uh, processing center in, <clears throat> in California, uh, division of Holstein USA. And about three years ago, uh, we got you know, talking about this program that has evolved into what we now know as TriStar AMR, okay? <clears throat> and we would see some... Uh, you know, guys going off of registering cows and things like that and kind of look at it. And, uh, you know, so that, that, was, that was playing on us. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, so anyway, if we look at the demographics of the average Holstein herd and the demographics of a lot of the robotics, they're about the same, about the same herd size and things like that. So I think we've got a lot in common. As I've had the opportunity to work with this program over the last couple of years and visit with producers and stuff like that, I think, um, you know, the, if you would call it the, the grade robotic herd, for instance, probably should have a, a maybe a little heightened interest in genetics over and above uh, a traditional type dairy, uh, just because uh, you're looking for a lot of right sizing on the cows, right? Physical size, right milking speed, a lot, lot of stuff that genetics can bring to the table. So anyway, I'm, I'm veering off the script here just a little bit and probably well, should go back to stay with it. But uh, so in discussions at the Holstein office, we started talking about, you know, can we do some program like this? Can we pull this data directly uh, and, and get it on the pedigrees, okay? And so we hatched this idea. We approached a couple of, uh, of uh, uh, Holstein members that had robots. Um, and we started talking about what we wanted to do, basically extract the data off the system and compute the records like you would a normal DHI record. And um, those first two members, Lindsay and I went to, uh, took out a trip to New Hampshire and Vermont, uh, just a one-day trip to visit with a couple of producers and explained what we are doing, both of those Holstein members, almost all registered cattle, if not all registered cattle. And then we got done with the description, both of them looked us in the eye and just said, what the hell took you so long? You know, so that really motivated us, okay? It's like, okay, we got two guys, they came up with the same conclusion, a very encouraging conclusion, and uh, so let's get to it. So, so anyway, what is TriStar AMR, first of all, okay? So TriStar is the Holstein Association's longstanding program to administer production records, right? We've got uh, three levels of, of TriStar. And then the AMR part stands for automated milk records. So basically, it's a program to administer production records from automated milking systems. Simple as that. We've been very involved with Laley for a very a number of reasons on it, but it is open to all of them, and we very much encourage some future discussions with other manufacturers as well. So why did, why did we develop this program? So what we saw was a farm installs the robotic milking system. Farm sees how much info the robot provides and stops DHI testing uh, to save money and hassle. And some of that money thing is, it's been mentioned, Brad mentioned, the cost of the TriStar AMR program is about equivalent to the cost for, a, on an annual basis, is about the cost of one DHI test. Cost is a factor, definitely. Hassle is a factor, and quite frankly, in discussions with quite a few producers, some of them point blank just question the results of the component component results coming out of the out, out, out of the DHI system. And I've got some theories as to why that is. Um, has to do with, you know, how often the cow visits it, the intervals behind between it, carryover in the system and all that kind of thing. So so anyway, this, the farmer decides, hey, I don't I'm not gonna test anymore. Too much money, too much hassle, all that kind of stuff. He's still registering cows. Then he can see his official hosting pedigree and now lacking some important information i.e. Uh, production, uh, what producers have called, told me is a hole in the pedigree, okay, and that's like a, a big sin. So farmer now feels that his registered Holsteins are less marketable due to empty pedigrees, 
And then they ask, so why are we still registering cows? You know, so, I mean, you know, you know, it doesn't seem to have any value anymore. And um, I think one thing that this program has taught me, and I knew it had value already, but it really, front and center, talked about the value of a Holstein pedigree. Because uh, you guys are just saying, hey, there's value in this. Okay, we want to see that production data on there. We've come up with this program called TriStar AMR. And so what are the requirements for participation in the program? So you have to have an on-farm system uh, that records both milk weights and components on an every milking basis. Agree to keep the data calibrated versus the bulk tank uh, software and bulk tank software in the robotic software. And then allow us to provide access to the monthly reports from the software required to process the records on the herd. So basically we're pulling the, the data off of the robotic system that you, the DHIA, would you be used for DHIA, if you would, okay? So we're gonna have the milk weights, we're gonna have the component indications, and I think that's an important in thing that it is an indication as opposed to an actual test, right? Um, uh, so th so that's, that's important. And then we need things like what we would call enrollment information or pedigree information. Sire, dam, reg number, unique identifier of some sort, the 840 number, that sort of thing. Um, so so we, we, need, we need that, we need status, dry dates, fresh dates, uh, uh, breeding dates, all that sort of thing, and we literally put this data right to the same system we do a DHIE record, okay? It is no different, okay? So how does this all start out? First of all, there's a contact with the customer. In Brad's case, he saw it in the Pulse. Um, other times people have become aware of it through a Holstein wrap. Sometimes they've seen it some other place and they call the Holstein office, all right? Um, that starts out with an enrollment record, all right? So we've got Holstein account number, herd code, contact person, numbers, all that sort of thing. Um, there's an initial discussion already, first of all. And then I usually get on the phone with the guy and, and try to make sure that this program is going to meet the needs of the producer. In other words, one of the limitations we have on this right now is those herds that are in TriStar AMR are not eligible for Holstein Awards, okay? Um, that may change, but at this point, I, I don't have that to offer. So if, you know, if you're used to getting some, one of the Holstein Award programs, uh, Progressive Breeder Award or something like that, and that means a lot to you, then this program is probably not for you. It's simple as that, okay? Um, but, so, they, I wanna make sure that people are aware of the limitations of this. Um, we think it's a very good program, but it has some limitations, and people need to know that, and it needs to be transparent. So I usually have a, a you know, 15 minute phone call at least or so with people, just kind of walking through this whole concept, all right? Um, so the customer, um, we contact the customer and then we say, okay, we need access to your, in this case, uh, your system or your T4C with, with the Laley herds. And we're gonna extract this information once a month. And just like Brad mentioned earlier today, basically it starts out with an email saying, hey, we're gonna pull the monthly data and we need your milk shipped, compare milk shipped data so that we can have a milk ship comparison. And with that, the data gets extracted once a month from the system. We process the record like we would a DHI record, send back a few reports to the herd owner, such as a herd summary. Uh, we've got our test day status report, usually some sort of a listing of the cows and that sort of thing. Um, and then at the end of the month, all of the herds that are on the program, we run the completed records, the 305, the 365, the end of lactation record, send that on to our office back in Brattleboro for inclusion on the pedigree. Next month, we start the whole thing all over again, all right? It's just, just literally that simple, right? Um, and then uh, back at the Brattleboro office, they load the records into the database and they are immediately available in pedigrees, right? Oops, excuse me, okay. What's the fees on this thing, okay? So $17 per month herd fee, that happens to be the $17 is the whole number of a $200 annual fee. Uh, that's where we started out with it. Um, and then $2 for each completed 305 day record loaded for the host registered Holstein cows. So the examples, 60 cows and one robot, it's about $324 a year, assuming all 60 of those cows get a completed record on their, on their, uh, on their pedigree. 480 robots, eight boxes, uh, a little over, you know, well, uh, $1,164 per year. Um, some real beauty in this because the, the, the member gets charged when it hits the pedigree. And if we don't have the complete ID, um, it's not going to hit the pedigree, it's going to fall out on the edit, so there's a little bit of an onus on our end to make sure that we've got the ID in there properly and everything like that. Um, and it's really, our whole goal on this thing is to not be much of a hassle at all, okay? Just do it all in the background as much as possible. Um, I find out that if it's going to be a big hassle for somebody, they're probably not going to do it very long. 
TriStar AMR is colorblind. Um, we've mentioned Lely quite a bit today, okay? Most of our AMR herds are the Lely system, right? But we're happy to work with any brand as long as the system meets the program requirements. And we'll even talk and take it just a smidge further than that. Um, the GIA, GIA, GEA, however that's pronounced, uh, system. Uh, and we've got one herd that we're, we're trying to work with on that. They do not have the components, and so they're pulling the samples once in a while. Okay, that's, we're very early in this one, and realize we're early in this process. This pretty kicked off not even two years ago at this point, okay? So we're, we're, we are working with things a little bit. That's more of a uh, pilot project, if you would, to see if we can incorporate that. But um, ideally, the program would have the component indications, the milk weights, and then access to it and just extract the data. We do that in the background, and we send out some reports um, to the producer, which are literally DHI reports, as well as the data making it to the pedigree. So what we promise, good customer service. We hope you think there's good customer service. That's not our, our, our uh, you know, good customer service is the opinion of the customer and not what we, we send out. 305 and 365 day records on the pedigree. A set of core reports downloadable from our ATA website. We will mail them to you. We will email those to you. We would prefer that you got them off the website, okay? Um, and information stored in the Hosting USA database available for future developments. So this is what a, a record would look like on a cow. Um, this actually comes, uh, I believe, off of Scientific Holsteins uh, in uh, Wisconsin. But they were on the oops, traditional testing for a number of years at the one star and the two star for the, where it says tri, you know, tri star. And instead of the stars, we just put AMR. Just as simple as that. Okay. Um, you will notice that it also does not have a data collection rating here, all right? So that's a, a limitation. Um, you know, it also tips off anybody else looking at this pedigree that this is a record that's something different than pedigrees that are coming through the traditional system. Again, transparency is what we want. We have nothing to hide here, okay? It's just uh, we want to let anybody looking at this pedigree know where these records are coming from. Simple as that. And then these are a couple of our standard reports. Happens to be from uh, Pat O'Donnell up north there. Um, but this is our herd summary. So you get a herd average. You get broken up by lactation groups. It's a standard DHIA herd summary. We have a test day status report. That just kind of is a recap of test day averages per pens, number of cows, components, milking times, in some cases of milk ship total, although it looks like we missed it on this one here, but that's okay. Um, cow page. Um, and this would be basically our traditional cow page. We've got multiple uh, options on the cow pages. And if we did a little bit of, a bit of homework, if a cow was classified, we would actually put her classification, final score, and breakdowns right up here for the producer, being a whole team member. Um, and then we've got a number of options on a monthly list and a way, number of ways to sort this list. We had a little meeting out there in western Wisconsin here uh, back in November. And one of the members there said, boy, you know, I really like that relative value. When we were farming, you know, a regular processing center, we had this column for relative value, and that was so neat to go see the highest relative value cow after every test day. So I said, Matt, we've got this on this report. We can sort this report by high to low by relative value. And so the next test day, we put that in the system, and away we go. So um, what I've seen, and I don't mean to offend anybody here or anything like that, but there is just a lot of data that is provided by these robotic systems, a ton of data, right? But I don't see a lot of the traditional DHIA data. And having a few of these seminars with folks really kind of enlightened me on the value that they put on the reports that they're getting, okay? All of, every one of the panelists on the first panel said, there's just lots of information, lots and lots and lots of information. But I don't know if a rolling herd average rolls out, for instance, or not, okay? Um, you know, but you've got average days per cow, number of times they visit the stalls, tons of stuff. Um, so what are some of the current limitations to the AMR program? Well, we are not sending at this point the records to uh, <coughs> the Council on Dairy Cattle Breeding. Uh, we've had discussions with that about including that into the genetic program. But at this point in, that, in time, it is not quote unquote DHIA certified. And so therefore, um, these records do not go to the council. We have had some discussions with those folks on that, but, um, uh, and they're looking for new sources of, uh, of data. And I think there's ways that they can work with that. I think we've got the prototype out there already, how they handle owner sampler records. But, you know, leaves, remains to be seen how that's all gonna shake out. AMR records are not uh, um, eligible for any Holstein USA awards and is not included in complete. However, 
if I can mention or alluded to before, we did have some, we have had conversations with the Council on da Dairy Cattle Breeding about uh, sending data into them. Uh, but I, I, I do think that there's some real opportunities there. And hey, you know, I've, I've been in this DHI business a long time and I consider myself in the DHI business as running a processing center. Um, I think the challenge for our system is how do we work with data coming off these automated systems and not have the producer pay twice for it, okay? We're investigating efforts required and considering the implications for making AMR records eligible for Holstein herd and cow awards. There's cur currently a couple of, of uh, staff members at the Brattleboro office working on that, coming up with some recommendations. Um, you know, I can't promise you that that is gonna happen, but I think the likelihood is pretty high. Um, ability to load uh, previously completed lactations, okay. If the herd is coming off of a DHI test, all right, and we have all that previous lactations in the DHI system, we just simply have a form where, have, where the herd transfers from the existing processing center over to our processing center. There's a standard transfer file where the data gets transferred over. All the identification, production, and reproduction of data gets transferred across. That's the same format that is used when you buy a cow from a herd that's processed at a different processing center and you bring those production records over. Or a whole herd wants to switch processing centers or something like that. So standard transfer file is a format that's not used daily in our office, but probably at least weekly. Um, and it's used for individual cows as well as whole herds. Um, so we got that down, but if a herd has not been on test for three, four, five years, bringing those previous lactations that are in the system over is, is still a bit of a challenge for us. We don't have a very good automated way of doing that. Um, collecting health and other types of data from the on-farm systems, uh, that's uh, definitely something that we see as, as, as another step in our process. Um, one that didn't make it on here in, in, my goal, in my mind is to be able to pull over actual lactation records. Okay, so we've got robotics, uh, we've got meters in a barn, and they record the production of cows every, every milking every day, right? Okay, so we actually have the 305 day record of what the cow actually produces. And what do we do in the DHI system? We take a subset of that data so that we can estimate it. So why would we be estimating something we actually have the actual data for? Well, believe me, there's a reason why it developed like that, but uh, if Bill's got anything to say about it, we're gonna try to break that mold, all right? Um, and then finally, working on some uh, and developing some novel uh, genetic evaluations for traits important to robotic producers. And like I say, I think, you know, I just see the more I talk with, the, with producers about it, I just think there's some real opportunities for some of those producers out there that do not have registered animals to get excited about that because excited, more excited about the genetics because they're really looking for a specific animal to go through that box. And uh, that, that's what I see anyway. And just don't take my word for it. Uh, we've got a short video here from Mac Trees. The cows love the robots here at Dries Dairy. It's such a cow comfort and cow friendly environment that it makes the employees and the owners here at Dries Dairy very happy too. In 1977, we're milking 120 cows up until 2015. We wanted to expand in the best possible way, which I thought was looking at robots so we could keep our, just our four family employees, keep it a family based operation, and also give our cows the most cow comfort as possible. And I think robots do that because the longevity of cows are really increasing here at the farm. We had four employees with 120 cows in our tie stall barn, and now we have four employees with 240 cows in a robotic dairy. And I think efficiency is the key word coming in the future, if not now. I'm very fortunate to be able to graduate, learn you know, a ton of things, and then just to be able to apply it right away. You know, a lot of people don't have the ability to apply the information they have, and I was very lucky and fortunate to kind of throw all that data in that I learned how to manage a cow with my family kind of putting a lot of belief in my brother and I that we could be the future. Robotic milk machines have become a great feature on farms. It's a very free flow system, so cows have the availability to lay down, go get milked, go eat, but when they do choose to go get milked, there's a treat that is given out to each cow as their udders are being massaged, being prepped for the milker to go on. The laser will identify the teats, and then the milker attaches, she gets milked, she gets a cleansing on the udder, 
and the door opens up and she walks out and the next one goes in. Cows, they just like their routine. We ain't gotta push them to a parlor. They go and milk when they want. And when they do that, everything's clicking good. You know, when they're doing what they wanna do. Robots don't take you away from the cow. We are still around the cows very, very often. It's just that we're around them a little bit differently. We're not milking them two or three times a day. You are actually making yourself more aware of the cows by seeing them on the computer. Our computer refreshes every 20 minutes with new information. It has really allowed us to be efficient like we were per cow 30, 40 years ago when my grandpa was on the farm when he could look at each cow individually in the tie stall barn when he only had 20 or 30 cows. Now we're just doing it on a bigger scale with 240 cows. I give the young people a lot of credit. They pay attention. That information is all available. All you have to do is make use of it. And the Holstein cow, really, what's more important than knowing what's working for you? And if you're not improving, you're going backwards because your competition is going ahead. There's no such thing as staying even. We've been participating in TriStar AMR for about two years now. It was an easy decision because it was cost effective. The cost savings are extreme. TriStar AMR is a testing service for robotic dairy farmers. What is really important to me is the accuracy. The robots do a great job at measuring accuracy. It's a weekly average that goes into this cow's production, so her 305 day lactation record is going to be very accurate. And I think you can make the best management decisions through accuracy. So this cow, her box time is five minutes. She gets milked 4.3 times a day. She gives 124 pounds of milk. You know, that to me is a very efficient cow. And those are the cows that we want on the farm. The data that we're given with the robots, and for me to be able to use that data, is truly endless. You know, whether it's for breeding, whether it's for management decisions, whether it's for dry up, whether it's for insemination. There's so many different ways that I can use this data. And so TriStar AMR system has become such a beautiful asset to a farm like this. The TriStar AMR system has been awesome for us. It, uh, you just don't know your, your DH or testing, you know. It's just better for the cow, easier on me, because when we did test with the shuttle, you had way more fetch cows because it took longer, you know, to stir. We would go down on milk, and now we don't phase. It's amazing, you know. There's, there's no way I would go back to a shuttle. There is no way. Some of the key things that really get us over the top to be a well-rounded herd, I think is the communication between the employees. We have a managed game plan, and we go about it daily, and we don't cut corners. And I really believe cow comfort is a huge attribute to this farm. People want good quality. I think they're gonna get it, and it's gonna take a farmer to do it. The quality is so good in America. You know, whether it's here, whether it's down the road by our neighbor, I mean, we make good quality products and we help each other out, and you know, we, we try our best to, you know, make our consumers happy. It's a really rich heritage to me being on a farm. I could go down the list, I mean, truly about all these cows. I, I know a lot of pieces about all these cows, and I can normally go two or three generations deep on all these cows. People have their safe haven, you know, the place where they want to go. You know, mine's to the barn. You know, if I don't want to talk to anybody, I want to take it, take it down a notch. Come to the barn and hang out in here. I think it's a, it's a cool atmosphere. It's, a, it's where I choose to be. It's where I want to be. Uh, it's what I love to do. It's where I'm constantly being that, that high school athlete and always trying to get better, always trying to do better things, not only for my family, but obviously for the cows too. <laughs> like I say, our cows are our best working employees, uh, so we're going to treat them right and treat them well all the time. Well, I think at Agritech, we've kind of maybe bucked the trend of some of our other colleagues in the DHI industry, where we've actually had the opportunity to uh, kind of, you know, grow a little bit. Our, our numbers are up. If, uh, you know, we sh I showed some uh, numbers earlier today. And I think, I think part of the, the real key with that is, um, at least with the clientele that we work with, is cost is always a big deal, okay? And, and I think you, you need to keep your cost in line. I don't know that you always need to be the lowest cost person, okay, because lowest cost may be the cheapest, and cheapest isn't always what they're looking for. But, uh, you know, we're not in a, in a world today where, you know, I mean, money means stuff to people, and it's got to be economical, and it's got to be effective. And I think keeping that, uh, and, and, and stay engaged with the customer as much as possible as well. Um, you know, you need to, the customer needs to have a face with the company they're doing business with. And so I think it's, uh, it's about money, it's about uh, you know 
staying engaged with them, and uh, making sure that the product or service that you have fits for that person, okay? We're not trying to put a square peg in a round hole or something like that. Yeah, so when I think about the, the future of the dairy industry and where, where my company, Layli, fits into, into that picture, um, we have to look at, um, or what I think about is where our companies come from. Um, you know, Layli um, is innovative. It's in their DNA. Um, the family um, that has the name Layli um, has always uh, been looking to, to design and implement solutions um, that make the life of farmers easier every day. Um, many years ago, that was that would have been on the forage, the forage side. Um, uh, for many many years, their whole business was was in the uh, field, uh, field implement business. Um, it wasn't until the first milking robot um, version that came out in the early 90s uh, was their introduction into the into the milking uh, system. Uh, and since then, um, all the products and solutions that have come out. Um, are dairy barn focused, um, cow focused. Um, there's a lot of uh, emphasis within our organization about coming up with solutions that not only benefit uh, the, the person, the farmer, but more, more so the, the, the girls in the barn, uh, the cows. And I think that as we continue to be innovative um, and we look for new ways to improve life on the farm, um, but also think about the greater um, possibilities for um, feeding the world, you know, I think that's where you know we start to see other things coming coming down up on the horizon, like um, uh, the system that Brad uh, mentioned earlier, uh, our orbiter. Um, while it's in a validation phase right now, I think that shows uh, the commitment that Lely has to the food production, um, food harvesting, and and um, you know it, just uh, sustainability uh, and feeding the world uh, for generations to come. The bottom line is is on this whole all this record stuff that we have, okay? It's all an estimate, okay? And it's just how close that estimate is to actual, okay? I mean, um, when the tester's out in the barn and he's running through that meter, you know, the only true way of, of collecting the actual actual is have somebody in that barn every day collecting all that milk in a bucket and putting it on a certified scale, okay? I mean, that's the only real, real number, okay? Everything else is an estimate. And so the idea is, is how close is that estimate to actual? And, um, and in, in lieu of that, if you can have that, like I mentioned before, that transparency, is, this is where the records came from, okay? Um, the algorithm comment that you had earlier, I think is right on, okay? Um, producers tell me, hey, you know, anecdotally, you know, that, that they believe those numbers that are coming off the landing system as far as fat and protein is concerned, okay? I look at, I put my um, you know, commercial hat on, and, um, you know, it, it you know, may concern some people if a cow is really is supposed to have a 4.3 and she has a 4.5 or something like that, but if I have my commercial hat on, I'm going to manage that cow the same dog on the way, okay? I'm not going to make any changes, okay? And uh, so, you know, a high is a high, a low is a low, and everything's an estimate, okay? Doesn't mean we can't make progress, but let's put it in perspective. Yeah, so um, at least within our, our organization, um, you know, we look at the market um, trends, uh, forecasting, what the uh, what the industry is going to look like? You know, uh, we heard earlier uh, in John's comments. You know, you hear the the numbers, unfortunately, of uh, attrition in the industry. Um, so, what are the farms going to look like in 15 to 20 years? How many farms are going to be left? What are the size of those farms going to be? Um, it, it's it's hard to hard to think out that far um, uh, and say that uh, uh, put a number on where AMS is going to sit there. Um, what we do see is that. Um, whether it's small, medium, or large dairies, uh, AMS uh, has a role. Um, we're, we're proving every day um, that AMS can fit in any sized operation. Um, it's it's a, a, a solution that I think uh, any dairy farm right now that is uh, in the process of upgrading their milking system um, is giving a serious look uh, to AMS. Um, but. As I highlighted in some of the screens, there's a lot of decision-making factors that go into that and, and make it right for the individual farm. Um, what we certainly want to prevent is um, getting into a into a farm that isn't isn't right for AMS, and and so we really want to match the, the solution to the to the customer based on their goals. Um, 
I, I, I'm, it's difficult to put a number on it and say exactly where it's going, but I, I think if you look at the trends uh, over the 20 years that, that AMS has been um, exposed here in North America, um, that's going to continue to continue to climb. Um, I think uh, I can't speak for the other other brands and what they're what they're forecasting and thinking, but um, my sense is that the competition is going to continue to be there um, within the AMS uh, marketplace. I think that's healthy. Um, I think it's important that there's there, there's multiple options for producers to to choose between. It certainly benefits us um, uh, to have competition in the market, um, and it. it so the, the fact that there's going to be continuing, continuing to be multiple brands um, available suggests that um, this isn't going to go away and, and um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bigger, bigger share. Uh, but we've got a long way to go here in North America. We look at the maturity in some of the other markets around the world. Um, we're, we're well behind, uh, but a lot of that's just the, the introduction and being a little bit late to that game um, where Europe uh, has, has certainly seen um, the, the adoption a lot more quickly, but a lot of that's more based on some farm size, um, uh, country uh, laws, regulations that have prevented expansion in some cases and, and AMS fitting into those markets um, a bit earlier. But yeah, I, I would say that's where, where we're gonna be seeing it go is, uh, is up, um, but here in the US, milk prices, market conditions, um, farm numbers, um, those are all going to have an impact, of course. Yeah, I, I think for one, it's just the, the availability was there earlier, um, right? So introduction of AMS um, happened. So they're the only farm in the States with Herd Navigator. It's been in Canada since 2009. Uh, Europe's had it for 15 years. And that's something that a large dairy could manage a lot of cows with minimal people, with minimal shots. It's only a matter of time till regulations come in as far as giving cows, hormones, things like that, the producer pushes, that the U.S. is gonna have to adapt to. So technology on that, uh, the U.S. is much more regulated. Um, we don't have as many, we have more valves than any other country. Um, iodine in their milk, in Europe, things like that, so that, or chemical in their milk, so they do different washes, things like that, where we're more aggressive. State to state, it's more aggressive. Um, so technology starts in Europe, if Europe gets it, Canada gets it, and then we'll get it in 10 years. So that, that's usually the biggest thing that we're seeing more of, more trend. It is adapting quicker. Um, so we've had a robot at home for 10 years now, and when we first started, it was a phase and nobody was doing it, and now in uh, our 10 years of doing it, I've worked with 24 unit in New Zealand, 64 in Chile, and now they're saying hundreds and 150 unit barns in the US. So that's the biggest thing that it's not, it's not a little fad that's coming along that now it actually makes sense and tenses up. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I'm out in California, okay? Formerly, you know, I'm a Midwestern guy and stuff like that, though. But uh, I remember going to a uh, robotic session at World Area Expo more than 15 years ago, uh, probably one of the first ones in the U.S. or something like that. And it was one of the California producers there, and he was the guy that put in the first robotic system. And it was, I don't know, I think it was maybe a dozen or something like that, or 16, whatever. And uh, I remember having some Canadians come through for the big uh, World Ag Expo we have out there, and they asked me to speak about testing large herds, okay? And then they stopped at this installation, and he looked at me and he says, Bill, he says, robots work. This one's gonna fail. And sure enough, but within two years, there's lawsuits flying around and all that kind of stuff, and the conventional wisdom in California today is that experience set robots, but robots back at least 10 years in California. You know, the very first one came in and was a bust, okay? And everybody seemed to know about it. Um, but now, with all the, all the factors that are being cited here, the, especially labor, I mean, whether it's the immigration, whether it's minimum wage, I mean, you know, we're at 13 bucks now an hour in minimum wage, and the, like, the guys I talk to out there can't hire a guy for 13 because he's gonna be going down the neck the road for, this, for something more, and it's just frustrating, you know? Um, so they see that as, as, as an opportunity, although we still don't have very many installed out there at this point in time. And I was kind of a little bit surprised on your map because I thought maybe Tillamook would show up. In that area seems like it's uh, Oregon. Uh, seems like there's quite a few boxes going in there as well. So, but um, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, but I gotta say, I think, you know, your comments about, I think there's more money in the Canadian market. Uh, uh, 
dairy industry and they get more paid more for their milk. So I think there's maybe a little bit more money to go around. And I don't think this is any real, you know, gee whiz, uh, startling revelation, but people got money, they spend money. And when they don't have money, yeah, they got to think about when they spend their money, right? You know, so um, and I think that's, uh, I don't know, M maybe I'm way off base on that one, but that's my theory. Anyway. And maybe just add uh, one, one comment too, just uh, when we think about our market, uh, how we look at North America as one market, Canada, the U.S., um, so everything we do is, is, you know, across that, across that line from a, from a, from a brand standpoint, but uh, we even see the, the, the differences between Canada and the U.S. on, on technology or regulations. Um, one of the big things um, from our standpoint that, that was uh, what we consider a win um, for AMS was the somatic cell counter uh, for us. Um, you know, just across the border to the north, that was never never a problem. Um, most of the boxes up there have a somatic cell counter uh, on them, uh, but only until the last year year or so have we been able to implement those um, on our on our on our uh, milking robots. So. Things like that are where um, you know you, you see progress starting to come, and a lot of that is, is um, unfortunately just regulations. You know, um, it wasn't that long ago either that some states, like Bill, Bill talked about California, um, just some states were were um, hesitant to to um, approve or let milking robots come in, and and uh, um, now uh, it's my understanding that um, with the recent PMO. Um, Milking robots are accepted in every state. Doesn't mean they're there, uh, but the opportunity is, exists now for milking robots to come into any state, um, in you know, with the proper um, um, steps being being taken by the manufacturers, um, they, there shouldn't be any roadblocks to getting those implemented. But that wasn't always the case. You know, I, I I'm not the final decision maker on that, but that has come up quite often, um, and. Um, I, I would say that's uh, certainly uh, something that will be considered here before too long. Uh, we get that a lot from the reps, you know, why isn't it included and that sort of thing. And I think it's safe to say, if I could speak for us a little bit, I think what, as we designed this program, we kind of wanted to walk before we ran. We didn't want to put everything in there, even the you know, production records and the awards and stuff like that. Um, you know, we were very cognizant of the fact that this could be criticized, this could be, you know, just got to kind of play the politics and stuff also, right, you know? And, you know, I think it was a good thing that we didn't jump too fast with it, but I think as time goes on, it's just, it's, it's an evolution. It's, it's, it's not stagnant. It's going to continue to evolve, and I think hosting complete is, would certainly be one of those considerations. I think the key benefit is greater accuracy on the, on the reports, the accuracy of the data. I think the ease of it and the, and the lower cost. Well, first, first and foremost, I, if they haven't done so, it would, it would definitely be to visit uh, other robot farms. Um, I, I, I know there are some farms that, that have uh, purchased robots, installed robots, and, and said that they never toured. They just um, just made the decision. But um, uh, I, I always highly advise people to make sure that they've gone and done their homework. Um, look at different barn designs. Ask questions of the, of the other farmers. I, I know... Um, when I look at our customer base, um, they're generally very willing to, to host um, uh, prospective uh, AMS farms um, so that they can come in and learn from them. What would they do different, right? That's always one of the, the popular questions of a robot farmer. Um, you know, it sounds like everything's going really well here, but what, if you could do something different, what would you, what would you uh, do? Uh, and, um, you know, and just take those learnings back to their own system as they start to draw up plans for their barn, um, whether it's new or retrofit, um, there's a lot to be learned from there. So that would be probably my number one piece of advice for somebody that's on the fence. Um, if they have done that, um, I think it comes back to um, trying to understand what, what, at the end of the day, what their goals are as, as a farmer. Um, you know, what do they hope to get um, out of the next five to ten years of their, of their farm or even longer term? And help them see if there's a way that AMS is going to fill some so fill some holes uh, in their ability to reach those reach those goals